patent though, and we published this, was that acetoacetate inhibits growth and reduces ATP concentrations consistent with what, what we're calling an inefficient Randall cycle, not present in fibroblast controls, that the reduced ATP and the parallel cell growth reduction uh, was a statistically very uh, high value, and it was consistent with uncoupling due to overexpression of UCP2 lines in the cancer cells not seen in the controls. Now, we have a very significant limitation in this study, which is why we had actually a great deal of difficulty getting it into a more widely circulated journal. But, and we realized this, and we admitted it freely, we didn't actually prove that the acetoacetate was metabolized, okay? We inferred it, it's consistent with it, but we didn't prove it, okay? So that's where that stands. And we're working on that now. Now, the question is, aside from these, these, these kinds of data, are there other things in evolution, human evolution, agriculture, carbohydrates, evolution of cancer cells, that add up to something more? There are many plausible mechanisms that exist, as I'm mentioning, for cancer's vulnerability to clock restriction. But are there anything else that might enable mechanisms of susceptibility? The first thing I want to just discuss briefly is hominid evolution. And, you know, we've basically been evolving for at least three million years, mostly as hunter-gatherers. And uh, we could probably characterize the hunter-gatherer lifestyle as the occasional, you know, protein or rich uh, feast after the hunt goes well followed by averting starvation through the occasional nuts and berries, but we didn't have abundant grain, that's for sure. But aside from the paleontological evidence, which Loren Cordain has documented very well, the best evidence is actually our biochemistry in ourselves. We're adapted to starvation. We don't need carbohydrates. And this was actually beautifully shown by Owen and Cahill in the 1960s, where they took morbidly obese people, and they just gave them water for eight weeks, and basically they did fine. I mean, they lost weight, but nothing else happened to them. They gave them water and trace, trace uh, minerals. And what are our adaptations? Well, we know what they are. It's gluconeogenesis, which serves the brain for short-term fasts, and ketosis, which under longer duration then spares protein. So we're adapted to starvation. We don't, there's, there is no metabolic requirement for carbohydrate, as Eric Westman has pointed out. There's nothing to document. So what else might enable mechanisms of susceptibility? Well, what about civilization? Civilization equals agriculture, all right? It's, ten, it's just 10,000 years old. The abundance of grains and vegetables. And prosperity and nutrient excess is perhaps just the last 100 years, right? So it's very plausible that large cohorts of individuals in the developed world, at least, do not experience sustained periods of ketosis in the modern diet. I'm not saying that's true of everybody. I mean, it's not going to be true during fasting due to uh, cultural or religious observances. It's not going to be true during famines, such as in war or in underdeveloped countries. And ironically, of course, it won't be true in people who are trying to lose weight on a low-carb diet. But um, most of the time, for most of us, except for the people in this room, we're eating a lot of carbohydrate due to abundant grain, and we're not engaged in sustained ketosis. What else can enable mechanisms of susceptibility? What about cancer's evolution? Well, cancers actually, as I was pointing out earlier, generally don't start off as a cancer cell, but they start off as a benign abnormal cell. And in fact, <coughs> cancers evolve within a microenvironment, and they start from one abnormal benign cell until they have to reach about 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th cells before they can achieve a size large enough to be detected. And they have to undergo multiple mutations in order to survive that long. And before they finally, that's about the limit of detectability. There's one other concept which I have to introduce, which is that of genetic drift. And uh, to say it sim simply, uh, it's that in the absence of, any, of a selective environmental pressure and given sufficient time, all survivable accidental genetic and phenotypic niches are going to get filled. Now, I can give you a very concrete example of that. That was first stated by Kimura in 1955 and he's elaborated on it significantly since then. But the best example is antibiotic resistance. If you overprescribe an antibiotic, the bugs are going to get resistant to it. And this was true for... Salmonella typhi, the organism for typhoid fever in, the, in, in, in India and Pakistan in the late 90s. It had been used for typhoid fever for years and the bugs were completely resistant. They stopped prescribing it. And they reintroduced it again about 10 years later. From genetic drift, many of the organisms were now susceptible to it again. So you see it's, the, it's removing the selective pressure that allowed that environmental niche to get filled again. All right? So in the app, that's what genetic drift is. So, 
the inference for cancers. In the absence of the selective pressure of sustained ketosis in our society and other effects of a low-carb diet, we would expect cancers to express a range of accidental adaptations and equally accidental vulnerabilities to a low-carbohydrate metabolic environment. But a plausible mechanism was for cancers to be vulnerable, also to be resistant. Remember, resistance to ketosis isn't hard either. All they have to do is not metabolize the ketone bodies. Right? Both are possible. So all else being equal, you no. Know, if we if we live in a state of ignorance, what we would expect approximately equal distributions of cancers in our society for vulnerability, perhaps stability, or perhaps adaptation, which would mean progressive disease. Okay, roughly. I'm just you know this is guess guesswork, but it's what we expect. So if I try to pair this down to an actual <coughs> hypothesis. We start like this, that low-carb diets and starvation have many metabolic similarities. There's decreased secretion of insulin, insulin-like growth factors. There's ketosis, there's fatty acidosis, there's fatty acid synthase inhibition. There's decreased inflammatory markers. There's also uh, coordinated knockdown of multiple targets for cancers in the molecular level. And human tissues are actually adapted to these features. The paleontological evidence tells us that, and our own biochemistry tells us that, because we undergo gluconeogenesis as well as ketosis. So, if we take the second step here, the cancers start off as abnormal benign cells, but that hypoxic cell growth far from the vasculature leads to HIF1-alpha and a common hypoxic glycolytic phenotype, but that uncoupling protein 2 provides a survival advantage for some hypoxic cells, which would otherwise be subject to reactive oxygen species-induced apoptosis, then we would expect large cohorts of individuals with cancers in the developed world not to experience periods of sustained ketosis or other metabolic features common to the low carb state. And in the absence of selective evolutionary pressure, we would expect many cancers to express a range of accidental adaptations, but equally accidental vulnerabilities to the low carb state. So aggressive cancers are plausibly vulnerable, as well as adapted to the effects of an unfamiliar metabolic microenvironment provided by a carb restricted diet. So, in other words, this is not going to be a panacea. Some people will respond and some don't. But that doesn't tell me that it's something that we're pursuing. If anything, it tells me, let's identify the patients and the cancers that are most likely to respond. So we began recharge in February of 2006, and with uh, a lot of license, so I don't want you to look too closely at how the letters were formed, but it stands for Reduced Carbohydrates and Resistant Aggressive Tumors. And, uh, pretty close. And the most compelling reasons for a human trial is that there's little harm in a diet compared with conventional therapies. There are a few options for eligible patients. I mean, if you're starting a study with a new therapy, you have to do it with patients who have run out of options. And patient motivation would likely be high um, if threatened with uh, terminal disease. And feasibility and safety alone, even with that efficacy, would be a stimulus for the study. So our main objectives were, in fact, first one we have to do, which is safety and feasibility. And uh, we designed it as a 28-day trial. Um, the patient completed it about 14 days without adverse effects. We would consider it to be uh, successful. Um, don't worry, they all completed at least 26 days. So. And the entry and exit PET scan was used as a surrogate marker for efficacy. We were hoping to see if we might have some evidence of that as well. And uh, so we had a website and we were registered with uh, clinicaltrials.gov, emergingmed.com, and other various different website sources for finding trials. And uh, we got some referrals from our local oncologists as well as people who found us. Eligibility uh, was basically patients had to show a positive PET scan, in other words, a solid hypoxic glucose-dependent tumor. That at least announced that the, glucose, that, that the tumor was dependent on glucose, but also would allow us to follow this tumor subsequent PET scan. It didn't guarantee by any means that these tumors would be sensitive to call prescription. So that's a separate question. These are patients who have either failed or refused chemotherapy. So they're on, on a chemo holiday, could be between chemotherapies. They can't be too thin because uh, cancer is thought, you know, known to be a wasting disease. And, and if patients, and since this is ordinarily thought of as a weight loss diet, the investigational review board would have mixed that idea. They shouldn't have met.